who is the New York Times bestselling author of five young adult novels, Tell Me Three Things, What to Say Next, Hope and Other Punchlines, Admission, and most recently, Year on Fire. Her middle grade debut, The Area 51 Files, is the first in a three book series for readers ages eight to 12. She's also the author of two critically acclaimed novels for adults, The Opposite of Love and After You. She is a former lawyer and graduate of University of Pennsylvania and Harvard Law School. She lives in Los Angeles with her husband, two children, and more books than is reasonable. We could probably spend an hour debating how many books is reasonable, but Julie, tell us how did a former lawyer end up as an Edgar nominated middle grade author? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I was a very miserable lawyer. I wasn't just a lawyer. I was a deeply unhappy lawyer. I was the kind of lawyer who on Sunday nights would have to, would cry about going to work on Monday morning. Um, and so as part of a New Year's resolution, I think like 17 years ago now, I quit my job as a lawyer and decided to like fulfill my bucket list item of writing a book. And while I wrote that book, I would figure out what kind of lawyer I wanted to be. But within you know, two days of sitting down and starting my first adult novel, I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. It felt more organic, more natural um, than anything I'd ever done before. Um, and then I got super lucky from there. Um, I had it. I found an agent relatively quickly and got a deal with Random House relatively quickly in a way that doesn't normally happen in real life, sort of stars aligned in sort of this mystical, magical way. Um, and I've been writing full time ever since. And then recently um, during the pandemic is sort of when I made the switch um, to middle grade. Um, and that's a much longer story, but it's sort of about being in a, needing a happy place to escape to when things that's were amazing. not out there. Can we, uh, maybe we should issue a disclaimer to other lawyers that it doesn't typically work like this, right? <laughs> it's not. I always feel very nervous telling that story because I feel like <clears throat> it's, it's I, I almost like want to say, do not quit your job to write a book. It is the stupidest thing I ever did. It just turned out to be the best for me. Oh, I can't hear you. I don't oh. know. What oh, kind of go. law did you practice? I was a litigator. Um mm. And which is very funny because I hate conflict. I'm not <laughs> sure what I was thinking there. <laughs> well, you certainly need to put a lot of conflict on the page, but maybe it's maybe it's easier in, in that forum. Much, 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 much easier. If I'm not the one who has to fight it, it's fine. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, Martha Jocelyn, a Canadian writer, has lived in uh, Toronto, England, New York City, and Stratford, Ontario, a collage illustrator as well as a writer. The Seaside Corpse is her 50th published book. Oh my gosh. Uh, she was previously Edgar nominated for Aggie Morton, Mystery Queen, The Dead Man in the Garden. Uh, Martha, your bio is so short and so modest that I simply must know more. Uh, your website says that you had a lot of different jobs before becoming a writer, including a theater usher, a cookie seller, a waitress, a sailor, a photo stylist, and a toy designer. Uh, also that you had your own design company for 15 years. But of course, what I really wanna know is about your job as a sailor. Okay, my job as a sailor was I, I had an adventure the year that I was 20. And I went with a total stranger who I met through a friend, we went down to the Caribbean, uh, to Antigua. And we walked around the dockyard until we got a job on a yacht. And I, we were on that first yacht for about uh, six weeks, maybe. And then we, I got a job on a different yacht as the cook. And we actually sailed on that yacht. The first yacht, we were just cleaning up in harbor. But the second one, we actually sailed. I crossed the Bermuda Triangle and survived um, and went all around the Caribbean, the, the Virgin Islands, both British and American, and up to the Bahamas and and uh, it was a great, you know, a few months of a young person's life. And I just this winter went back to Antigua for the first time in 45 years. And that was, uh, that was, it was really exciting to see it again, actually. <laughs> I, I have two follow ups. One is, uh, did you witness anything unusual in the Bermuda Triangle? And uh, two, have you used that experience in anything you've written? No to both. Sorry. <laughs> I could I could lie. I could make some stuff up, but yeah. nothing. <laughs> I'm so impressed by writers who, who don't use every single thing that's happened to them because I certainly do. 
probably in some tiny way, yeah. but it was so long ago. So oh, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Kekla Magoon writes novels and nonfiction books for children and teens, often exploring themes of identity, community, empowerment, and social justice. Acclaimed titles include The Season of Sticks Malone, winner of the Boston Globe Hornbook Award, How It Went Down, a Coretta Scott King honor book, and Revolution in Our Time, The Black Panther Party's Promise to the People, which was a Michael L. Prince honor winner and National Book Award finalist. Kekla received the 2021 Margaret A. Edwards Award, a body of work recognition for a significant and lasting contribution to young adult literature. Kekla, you seem so young to have received an award like that. Uh, <laughs> Kekla holds a BA in history from Northwestern University and an MFA in writing from Vermont College of Fine Arts. Uh, I was reading your bio on, on the, your website, and I love how it's written backwards. Uh, I also love how you tackle so many different kinds of books. And I know you've written middle grade adventure novels before, but is Chester Keene Cracks the Code your first actual mystery mystery, or am I missing something? Yeah, I think it is. Um, in fact, I, I didn't even really know it, it was a mystery because it's not quite a genre mystery. It has very <laughs> mysterious elements and there's a puzzle and a code that has to be cracked and solved. And, um, you know, Chester loves learning spycraft and loves solving puzzles as I do, um, and is, is hoping to help save the day. Uh, but I was thinking of it as, yeah, puzzles and codes. And um, of course, at the end of that, you're solving a mystery. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I had never tackled a mystery before. Um, and now that I've gotten to be on lots of panels talking to other mystery writers, I'm really excited to try more mystery writing and um, you know, a real true genre style mystery and other things. It, is that is the realization that it was a mystery something that came to you or did your editor inform you, hey, you just wrote a mystery? <laughs> um, I, I think I realized it during the writing process. I mean, possibly in conversation with my editor. It's just something that I, I, hadn't, I hadn't set out to do, right? I was setting out to write a contemporary middle grade novel about this character who loves spycraft and loves to clean. <laughs> Those are his, his sort of defining features. And, um, and so he... Um, he kind of snuck up on me as a character, but also, you know, the fact that his story was a mystery was uh, a surprise to me. And so I was figuring it out as I went, which is kind of how I work. Just try something and see what, what it turns into. Are you a mystery reader as well? I am. Yeah. I love watching mysteries and reading mysteries and thinking about um, that type of puzzle story. And so it, it, doesn't really surprise me that I would write a mystery. I mean, the very first um, novel that I ever wrote, which is not published, I mean, I wrote it way back in high school, was a romantic thriller that was very, you know, had lots of twists and turns and, you know, evil twins and, you know, all sorts of things coming out of the woodwork. Um, every mystery cliche you can imagine <laughs> in one in one uh, draft. So definitely it's been something, you know, I grew up reading Nancy Drew and, and Encyclopedia Brown and loving those types of stories. So it certainly um, has been an influence on my reading. Well, we definitely hope to read more mysteries from you in the future. So last but not least, Sam Sedgman uh, is a best-selling novelist, playwright, and award-winning digital producer. He grew up with a railway line at the bottom of his garden and has been fascinated by trains ever since. He shares his nomination with M.G. Leonard, who I, we understand is cruising the Nile, possibly for research, maybe just for fun, uh, the duo were previously nominated for The Kidnap on the California Comet, another title in their Adventures on Trains series. Uh, Sam, rarely do we see such a direct line from childhood experience uh, to authorial success. Can you tell us a little bit more about that train? Which train line was it? How often did the trains pass by? And when did oh. you write your first ever train fiction? Oh, you want to know the nerd details straight up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I grew up, uh, I'm talking to you right now in London, uh, which is not too far from where I grew up in a village called Twyford, which is near a town called Reading, just spelt like reading, but said like Reading. Um, and at the bottom of my garden, there was a branch line that went off to uh, a little town called Henley on Thames. And because uh, it was a branch line, there'd be like one train every hour clattering back and forth. And you would hear it coming. And I would run down the lawn like a crazy person and jump up onto the compost heap to wave over the fence, uh, the trains as they went past. And that's something that brought me joy as a child and uh, that I grew up into a, a grown up and I kind of put that joy away. Because, you know, when you become an adult, you must put away childish things, et cetera, et cetera. Promptly went to university to study creative writing and was told that, you know, writing was serious business. And you should write about serious, important, difficult, complicated things about the state of the world. 
Um, but it was only when I became friends with uh, my co-author, Maya M.G. Leonard, many years later, uh, and saw her having so much fun writing uh, novels for young readers, uh, that I sort of remembered the two things I'd loved about, well, one thing I liked about writing was that it was supposed to bring you joy and happiness. And that uh, by writing about the things that made me happy as a child, I could I could rediscover that joy. And um, and I really kind of clicked into uh, to writing for children, which is not something that I ever really considered when I'd been at university thinking that I had to be very serious business. Um, <laughs> so really the secret of my, the joy of my childhood turned out to be the secret of my adulthood, which was uh, a nice full circle moment, really. Wonderful. Did you ever get any uh, interesting reactions from the passengers on the train that you were waving to from the top of your compost heap? Oh, well, you never really see the passengers, but you normally see the driver. And the driver, often when they see someone waving to them, will sound the horn or blow the whistle, which is what we're all looking for when we <laughs> wave at a train, I think. Uh, and it's one of those wonderful small moments of whimsy that you can capture for yourself in the modern world, which I, which I really delight in and still do to this day. I encourage you all, viewers, when you see a train, wave at it. It might delight you. Waving at trains. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much uh, for, for joining us. This is uh, such a, a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure, obviously, to read your wonderful books. Um, so for those of you, for those in the audience who are just kind of learning about your nominated books for the first time and haven't done any Googling or anything, I'd love to ask each of you to kind of give us the elevator pitch and maybe tell us a little bit about where the book fits into your oeuvre, like whether it's a series continuation, whether it's a departure for you, something new. Uh, and Sam, why don't you go ahead and start and we'll go back in kind of reverse order. Sure, right. Well, um, Murder on Safari Star, here you are, uh, is, as you said, the third uh, installment of our Adventures on Trains series, which are exactly as they sound. They are Adventures on Trains. Uh, they follow an 11-year-old boy called Harrison Beck, uh, who travels with his uncle, who's a travel journalist, Uncle Nat. And in every uh, story, they take a different railway journey somewhere around the world, and they always encounter a cracking mystery to solve. Um, murder on the Safari Star is the third story, and it is it was my first murder mystery, which is why it's particularly exciting to me as a lifelong fan of, you know, um, golden age crime fiction. Um, and it's a locked room, impossible crime story. So uh, traveling on the... Uh, steam powered safari star train through the savannas of South Africa. Um, uh, a passenger is found shot with a hunting rifle inside their locked compartment while the train is moving and is up to Hal and his uncle to find out who done it. Was it challenging to uh, think about how to handle actual murder in a middle grade story? Interestingly, yes, so we have, we always kind of try and use different kinds of mysteries in each one of our stories. We knew we wanted to do a murder mystery eventually, but we had a jewel theft and a kidnapping uh, before this. Um, but we thought, we found the safari setting was really kind of the key into talking about murder because um, before the murder happens, they go out on safari and you're introduced to predators and prey. And we have a scene of a lioness picking apart the carcass of a, of a dead animal. And so it kind of introduces the natural fact of death in nature into the story beforehand. So um, you're kind of priming the reader for that kind of uh, drama when it appears later in the story. But we did also do a lot of work, as I'm sure um, the other panelists will, will be familiar with, like managing the degree of peril, threat and exposure to violence that a child protagonist can have. So um, although there is a, a murder, which is you can uh, infer quite violent. Um, Hal never sees any of it. Uh, and one of the struggles that he has to deal with is that the grown ups are constantly trying to keep him away from everything about it as he's trying to solve it. Um, so, yeah, we did have to manage that quite carefully, but we found I think it makes it a lot more interesting to have to clear those obstacles when you're writing uh, for this age group. Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. Uh, Kekla, why don't, why don't you give us the, the elevator pitch for Chester Keene Cracks the Code? Uh, okay, great. Uh, so this is Chester Keene, Cracks the Code. Uh, I would like the record to reflect, Sam, that I wave at trains and so does Chester. <laughs> he actually waves at a train in the book, but there is a train station sequence in the book that's very Perfect. exciting. 
Um, so we have connections there. Um, so Chester Keen Cracks the Code is about a sixth grade boy named Chester, who is, he's very quiet, he's reserved, he's trying to find his way in the sixth grade at this new school. Um, he is someone who likes everything to be just so. He likes everything organized, he likes his things put away, he likes to clean when he comes home, if he needs to clean, clear his mind, he cleans the counters. <laughs> um, he's that sort of person, uh, very meticulous. And um, what one of the things he's being very meticulous about is spycraft training. Um, his, he is being raised by a single mom. His dad has, has is away, um, and he doesn't exactly know for sure where his dad is. But he gets packages on his birthday. He gets packages on holidays, and those packages contain presents for him that are from his dad. And they have postmarks from all over the country, and sometimes all over the world. And those packages have included, for example, a pair of binoculars, a uh, spy notebook, a book called the Know How Book of Spycraft that teaches you about secret codes and clandestine meetings and um, disguises and all sorts of things you need to know to be an international spy. And so Chester has put things together and thinks, well, my dad, who's not here, is somewhere out there as an international spy. And he's sending me the tools to train to be his assistant someday. So Chester is doing that very diligently in his sixth grade year. And so when he receives a secret message in code on his doorknob, when he is on the way to school one morning, um, he says, oh, this is a message from my dad. I have to crack this code in order to um, help him. He must be in trouble because otherwise he would not have sent me this kind of cryptic message. Um, and so Chester, with the help of Sky, a new friend that he meets who... Um, the note says he has to find at school. Um, with, together, Chester and Sky have to crack the series of codes uh, to try to help his dad and solve the mystery. So I, I love the detail that he's he's a, a kind of a neat Nick because it's such a like I love any any time a character trait surprises you, and of course we don't think of uh, young kids that age being uh, neat Nicks. Uh, how, how did you decide to kind of give him that character trait? He, so I, as I said, at one point, you know, he kind of snuck up on me as a character. I wrote a, a, a little draft. It was probably a page and a half, maybe even single spaced page and a half um, of a character sketch of this kid waking up in the morning and just being, you know, this is just so like I wear a polo shirt on this day of the week and I wear a t-shirt on this day of the week. Sometimes I wear chinos or, you know, khakis. Sometimes I wear jeans and, you know, but if I, on the day that I wear a polo shirt and khakis together, look out world, here comes Chester <laughs> Keen. And, and so like, he was just like going through his morning routine and he had everything like just so and he had his backpack packed um, and so I was just kind of following this little kind of quirky character who wanted things to be the way that they were uh, and then at the la at the end of this little paragraph this little scene that I was writing he he goes you know I packed my notebook packed my spy notebook uh you know and headed out the door and I was like what <laughs> 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 so um, I think that the the that quality of being meticulous um, is something that's fascinating to me because it's very much not who I am. <laughs> um, and but it's also something I aspire to be, right? Like it seems cool to me to be somebody who like is very organized. Uh, I'm <laughs> organizing ideas, right? Um, but not organizing stuff. Um, and Chester is good at both. And uh, and so I I think I tapped into that because it's something that fascinates me and intrigues me. Um, but I, I think also his meticulousness is a service to him in terms of his spycraft training, um, because in his notebook, what he does is he writes his observations and conclusions. That's what spies do. You make observations and then you draw conclusions. And so he looks at the world around him and he notices things and then he makes a conclusion. Um, things like, you know, I looked, you know, I looked in the parking garage and, you know, Mrs. So-and-so's car was moved. That means that she's already left for yoga class. Like he makes small observations, but he also makes... Uh, bigger observations about, you know, when his mom is happy, when his mom is upset, um, what is happening with peers at school and things. Um, so I think the idea that somebody who is meticulous in one way could be meticulous in other ways. And I wanted to explore how that um, that trait could benefit him, but also proposes some challenges for him because when he meets his friend Sky, Sky is the kind of person who will peel off her mittens inside out and throw them on the dirty cafeteria table, regardless of how much pizza detritus is there. And Chester's just horrified by this, like what? <laughs> um, so having this new friend who comes in and shakes up his his routines and his system is something um, that really challenges him. Um, but he, you know, he ultimately finds a really accepting and loving friend in her. She challenges him, but she doesn't try to change him. Um, yeah. And that friendship dynamic that was fun to explore. Oh, so great. Love it. Uh, Martha, please tell us a little bit about the Seaside Corpse. And uh, I understand it's a uh, possibly the last book in the series. Is that 
Say it ain't yes. so. <laughs> um, it seems to be coming up backwards, but maybe that's only at my end. This is um, Aggie it looks Morton. Good mystery. On our end. Okay, good. Aggie Morton, Mystery Queen, The Seaside Corpse is the fourth and final book in the Aggie Morton, Mystery Queen Quartet. Um, Aggie Morton is inspired by the idea that Agatha Christie is a 12 year old girl detective. And she has a best friend from Belgium whose name is Hector Perrault. And together they keep stumbling over bodies. There's a dead body in every book. And um, Aggie is the first on the scene in every case. And in this book, she, um, it's, it's the, the series takes place during the 12th year of Aggie's life. So um, fall, winter, fall, Christmas, some, spring, and then summer. So this one takes place in July in uh, Lyme Regis on the southern coast of England, where um, it's called the Jurassic Coast. And it's very, very um, fertile in terms of dinosaur, well, not dinosaur, but sea creatures, many bones. Mary Anning's famous discovery in 1811 of the first ever ichthyosaur happened on this beach. So that's that was um, the reason I chose it because in, for instance, in last year in the third volume, The Dead Man in the Garden, um, it takes place in Harrogate, which was the destination of Agatha Christie's real life um, runaway disappearance when she was uh, had that, you know, the mystery episode in her life. So I set my book in a lovely spa hotel in Harrogate so that with the conceit that if, you know, a 12 year old Aggie had had a wonderful time there, then of course a grown up Agatha Christie would go there. So it's the same thing with this book of, um, because Ag Agatha Christie later married an archaeologist and spent a lot of time digging, not for ichthyosaur bones, but for many pieces of history. So the idea was to give her an activity as a kid that she loved, which was looking into history and, and digging up. So she and she and Hector are companions at a youth, the, the League of Young Scientists. And so for the first time, Hector and Aggie are living in a tent and having outdoor experiences, which are a bit unnerving. And they do stumble across a dead body on the beach one morning when the uh, tide I, is down, so. I think Hector would get along with Chester very well when it comes to camping. I think they would both require a certain <laughs> <That's true. laughs> level of cleanliness. Yes. <laughs> I, I wanted to follow up with you on the question I asked Sam, you know, how do, how do you think about handling murder or a body or a corpse in a middle grade book? I think it's more, I think it's more upsetting for the adults in kids' lives than it is for the kids themselves. Kids are pretty gruesome for the <laughs> most part. Um, if it says on the cover that there's a dead person, any kid who's not ready to read about a dead person is going to think, I, mm, I don't think it, I don't want this book, but most kids will be like, yeah. <laughs> and um, I tend to have one or two sentences that describes the dead body and then just, and that's it. Yeah. Um, in this one, the most grotesque thing is the eye we could see was more like a jellyfish resting in the socket. So that's the most disgusting thing about it in the description of the corpse. And, and on we go. Then we find out who, who might have wanted this person dead. That was a, a great line and pretty gruesome when I paused to think about it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Julie... Why don't you go ahead and, and give us the pitch to the Area 51 files, which is not only your first middle grade, but also a series starter. Yeah, I just want to say, Sam, I lived in London for four years and I had a train in my backyard also. 
Um, but I was not a good sport about it because I did not know there was a train in my backyard until after I signed the lease. <laughs> so it was a, I kind of I did not wave at that train, especially at three in the morning when it. You like drove. waved your fist at that train as it went past. Extended yeah. the middle finger to that train. Yeah. yeah. It was not a joyous experience in the way it was for you. Um, anyhow, the Area 51 Files is about Sky Patel Baum. Um, she is an orphan and a loner um, and a champion French fries dipped in ice cream eater. And she is sent to live with her uncle, who she has never met. He has never written. He's never emailed. He's never sent her a smoke signal. She knows nothing about him. And as she gets closer and closer to his house, Things get weirder and weirder and weirder. And it turns out he lives at Area 51. And he is head of the FBAI, which is the Federal Bureau of Alien Investigations. And even better, at Area 51, it turns out there are lots and lots and lots of aliens. So Skye and her pet hedgehog, Spike, who is um, a cranky hedgehog, shall we say, um, team up with her neighbor, Elvis, who is from the planet Galzoria. And his dog, Pickles, who is an actual dog, <laughs> he is not, he's from planet Earth. Um, and on the day that Sky arrives at Area 51, a bunch of aliens go missing. So she is immediately suspected of this crime. And so she pairs up with her neighbor and they go off to solve the mystery of the missing aliens. And it's the first book in a three book series. And in each book, um, Sky and her new friends uh, team up to solve mysteries on base in Area 51. Um, and this book actually makes no sense in context of the stuff I've written before. Um, but it came about because during the pandemic, I live in Los Angeles and my kids did not go to school for a year and a half. Um, and it was a really tricky time in my household as it was for everybody. Um, and my son, who is now 10, but was you know seven at the time, kept asking me questions that I did not have answers to. He'd be like, so when are we going back to school? And I'd have to be like, I don't know, buddy. And he'd be like, when are we going to see grandpa? And I'd be like, I don't, I don't know. Um, are we going to get sick? You know, and it was really, it became so awful that every time he asked me a question, instead of being excited to answer, my stomach would hurt. Um, and one day we were sitting at dinner and he said, mommy, I have a question for you. And I was like, oh no, like, what could you possibly ask me now? And he said, what do you think happens at Area 51? And the light bulb went up over my head and I was like, this one, this is something I can do. Um, and so I wrote the book for him. Um, but let's be honest, I really wrote the book for me because it was so much fun to escape into this much kinder, gentler world. Do you have any uh, interest either now or when you were a kid in aliens and Area 51 and stuff yourself? Oh, absolutely. Um, I am kind of a little bit of a space nerd. Um, I, you know, I, I'd say 10 years ago, it would be really strange to be someone who believed in aliens and UFOs or um, other life forms. And now it's become way more mainstream, but I have always been on the UFO train um, for a long time. Bringing it all back to trains. Let's <laughs> the UFO train. Um, I, for, I, I forgot to say, yeah, since we're doing the train thing, Sam, I, I have to, <laughs> you know, I have to participate. We, I still, if I'm putting someone on the train in my little town, we put coins on the tracks so that after the train has gone through, I, we, so there's quite a collection of beautiful medallions. I'm that so have sorry to hijack the entire panel like this, but that, I'm so obsessed with this because you can't do that in the UK because they don't let you go anywhere near the rails, like station platforms are off the ground. It's a whole, stations are so different over here, but um, man, I'd love to do that. So nerdy, obsessed. I, I will say as someone who grew up in Montana, where it was really easy to get to the train tracks, we we crushed a variety of things on on train tracks. Every, every size coin we could get our hands on. <laughs> Oh, um, rattle okay. off the tracks like you can just put a coin on the tracks and the train runs it over. They can be hard to find yes. sometimes because they, they go flying it, into the gravel. Exactly. They get squished, they get squished but they down, also right? go. Yeah. Yeah. In this huh. paper. Yeah. But, but the best cool. ones still kind of hold the imprint of, of the actual, you know, coin. So you can see what it's not just a silver piece of, of metal or whatever. I feel wow. devastated now that I haven't put a scene of that in any of the Adventures on Trains books. That's something I'll have to you, do in the future. We're here to help. You better come and do the Trans Canada, you know. 
I, I'm obsessed. Would love to. <laughs> be four books that come out with this being the key to some murder mystery like yeah there'll be like a flattened penny is found on a body or something yeah i love this the killer's calling card yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh sam you you uh were talking a little bit about how maya kind of you know helped you write about trains as, as a you know find find like free you up to do that but how did you come to work together? Like, how did you decide to write together? And, sure. and what's your so process we, like? The two of us met when we both worked together at the National Theatre in London. Um, uh, you mentioned in my very nice intro that I'm a, a digital content producer, was my job before I became an author. And that's what I did at the National, and so did, did Maya. Um, and we had our desks side by side. Um, and the, the job I had there was basically, um, uh, I was project managing the uh, sort of, uh, the online media player where you could watch online the recordings of the National Theatre Live broadcast, basically. So I was making that available free to schools to watch online, um, uh, which you can, I think, now still do in America. You can pay for them online. It's called NT at Home. If you want to watch a play from the National Theatre, that's that's um, that's the thing. Um, but no, we we work together on an awful lot of projects before we ended up writing books together um but she um had a great success with a series of middle grade fiction called beetle boy uh, and she actually left the national theater to go and pursue that full time um and then we were having drinks together one night at, a, at an awards dinner actually and i said wow man your beetle boy books are so popular what do you want to write next and um that's when we got to talking about the the idea of writing a series of books about trains because she knew i really loved trains and her sons uh, were both kind of reluctant readers but really into trains and she's like if there was a series of books out there about trains they would uh be really popular but i can't write them because i don't know anything about trains and i was like <laughs> <laughs> guess who guess what i'm obsessed with and we just couldn't stop thinking about it and talking about it and so then we started to think about well can we write a book together i've never done that before i'd never written a book she'd never written a book with someone else i'd never thought about being a children's author before but the more we talked about how we might do it, the more we realized that we really wanted to do it and that we had quite a, a shared sensibility about the kind of books that we really enjoyed, the kind of stories that we really liked. Um, and it kind of grew and grew from there, really. Um, and uh, yes, I think the fact that we had worked together on an awful lot of like digital content projects together meant that we had already got over a lot of the awkward shorthand that you have to do when you do any project with someone. So neither one of us was afraid to tell the other one that something was a terrible idea, um, mm -hmm. we've, which is, happens a lot in writing, as we all know. Um, you have a lot of terrible ideas. Um, but it was great working with someone else who could very quickly uh, and enthusiastically uh, point out those terrible ideas to you and suggest <laughs> something better. So we had a wonderful back and forth. And we once we got going, I think we wrote a lot faster than I... Uh, than either one of us kind of sort of wrote independently um and in the way we actually physically do it because a lot of people ask us how do you write a book the two of you together um we tended to meet up for about a week together we would stay together for about a week to do all the thinking and all the plotting and all the planning of everything that would happen over the course of the story and then one of us would take that plan away and write a quick and dirty first draft and then we would basically take turns uh, writing and rewriting those drafts, mm. alternating it back and forth between us, maybe focusing on different pieces of the story each time, but basically polishing it up and making it better and better and better as we go. Um, that's how we came to write and that's how we write together um, through all of our Adventures on Trains books. How do you decide who writes the first draft? Do you, do you toss a coin? Kind of tossed a coin, kind of what, depending on who was more available at the time. Um, we tried to alternate um, <clears throat> Uh, but it just sort of seemed the right person did it at the right time. We never really argued over it. <laughs> it just sort of always seemed to fall into place. Yeah. Um, yeah. Surprise. Oh. It was surprisingly easy to write a book with someone, I have to say. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that, I think it was the right project in the right place. I don't think we would, we often say that we, we can't think of another series that we wanted to write together. And I can't think of very many other people who I'd want to write a book with. I think it's quite a rare and precious thing, actually. Well, as somebody who's who's co-writes pretty frequently, I love it. I, I, I recommend everybody try it at least once and see if it's for you. It's not like, writing's quite solitary, right? And that's the wonderful thing about writing with friends is that you have someone to talk to. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. 
Uh, Kekla, so many of your YA books explore like intense real life events like racial tension and the violence that ensues. And your middle grade novels like Chester Keen, some uh, like, you know, they exist in the real world, but they maybe offer a gentler version of the world. And, you know, with kids growing up so fast and sometimes the line between middle grade and YA blurring into tween and stuff, how do you decide what fits in YA and what fits in, in middle grade? And that's kind of a big question, but just like, how do you, how do you tailor your approach for different audiences? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I, I think I can answer the tailoring my approach question better than how I decide, because I think that the, you know, uh, it's partly just a marketing distinction. You know, mm -hmm. my very first novel, The Rock and the River, is about 1968 Chicago, but the character's 13. I originally wrote it as a 14 year old character, and then I sold it to a middle grade publisher and they were like, what if he was 13? And I was like, OK, <laughs> um, so, you know, so there's some. Um, murkiness right um especially for the age group that i write for which is always that kind of 10 to 14 age range that middle school you know there's a lot of transitions in, in that time period there are kids who um you know sort of mature in different ways at different times in that time frame right so you can be you know the really mature fifth or sixth grader and the really uh kind of uh, slow bloomer you know late bloomer ninth or tenth grader right like so that there's a um a kind of squidginess to what's appropriate for that age in general. Um, and so I just kind of lean into that <laughs> by yeah. writing uh, what feels right for each particular book. And then, you know, in some ways, letting publishers decide who to market it to. Mm -hmm. But also, um, you know, I think a lot about like the character's age, um, the main character's age as being an important um, thing that helps me decide how much um to bring in in what ways and what needs to be explained and what needs to be contextualized and how, you know, a child who's 10 is a much more concrete thinker than somebody who's 14. And so, you know, trying to address that um, difference in sort of worldview, um, mm -hmm. that shift in worldview that's occurring, I try to have a lot of respect for my readers and not talk down to them and not shy away from talking about difficult topics. Um, for, for the younger set, I just try really hard to include the appropriate context um, and to keep the book tonally where I want it to be. Um, you know, there's a moment in the season of Sticks Malone, which is a fun summer adventure with three boys where, um, you know, their dad is talking to them about, okay, you're three boys, you're, you know, you're black boys and you live in a predominantly white rural community. Like there are some things that I worry about on your behalf because of that, right? It, it, it doesn't have a huge bearing on the action of the story, but it's something that, you know, that their dad brings to the situation. This is why I tell you, you can't go outside of this neighborhood, right? And they've done that. So they're getting in trouble, right? So I, I try to make it age appropriate. I think in Chester Keene, um, you know, the focus really is on the mystery. So I mean, he is a biracial boy um, and his friend Sky is also biracial. So they have conversations about their identity and how um, they both feel like they're part of two worlds. Um, and, um, you know, but they're celebrating that in this context. It's not causing them specific challenges, um, but identity always comes with, <laughs> um, you know, some baggage in terms of how do you process it? How do I figure out who I am in the world? And that's just something that's always reflected um, in my characters. Um, but I try to follow like each story and each character and stay um, appropriate and not try to bring things in from outside. How do you stay in touch with the, the way kids at different ages respond to things? Do you, I, I don't know, do you have any um, kids you you use as your test readers or or anything like that? Uh, I don't usually use them as test readers, um, but I talk to them. I mean, I have kids in my life. I have, um, you know, a lot of fr my friends have kids of varying ages, um, you know, from babies and infants and toddlers all the way through, um, you know, high school and college and, you know, young adults beyond college. And so, um, you know, there are times when I will reach out to them and talk about, you know, especially like pop culture things that are shifting rapidly and, um, and you know, to, to say, hey, like, here's a paragraph. Does this, what makes sense to you about this and what doesn't so that I can understand how to contextualize things and um, and just being around them, spending time with them, uh, both the people in my personal life, but also the kids that I meet on school visits and at book festivals and, you know, the kinds of questions that they ask, the kinds of things that interest them um, and that they wonder about from my early books. I learned a lot from hearing those questions that helps me learn how to create 
you know, scenes and and um, uh, and moments in in subsequent books because I'm like, okay, so I know from all this experience of all these school visits that kids always ask about this, and I wrote it this way. So yeah. in this book, I'm going to write it a different way so that I can get a slightly different question or so that I they can focus on something different. So I've definitely learned a lot from just meeting lots of kids. Yeah, right. That's. <laughs> School visits, great, great research technique. <laughs> Go to oh, school. Yes. <laughs> they will, the kids will tell you how it <laughs> is. <laughs> and they will tell you what they don't understand, which is yeah. really beautiful. I think that they're unafraid to say, I don't get, you know, I don't get that. Can you explain that? What does this mean? Why does he, why does this happen? Why does this happen? Um, and so, yeah, it just helps me realize there are so many things that, you know, we expect as writers for the reader to draw connections. Um, and for the reader to bring a certain amount of outside knowledge. And you really, as a children's writer, have to strip a lot of that away. You know, you can get away in writing for adults with assuming that characters, that readers are going to know certain things um, about the world. And you can't assume that with kids. So there's just um, a process of really defining things and, and doing it carefully. Yeah. Martha, you had said earlier that you had kind of conceived of these four books as, as all being different seasons. Did you... Uh, always conceive of the Aggie Morton series as kind of a, a four book outing or or did you make a decision later that this was going to be the final book? The decision was made later. later. I, I started out with with just a, a two book contract for the first two. And and so and part of the part of the effort was to introduce classic tropes of mystery writing um, that they are historical. I forgot to mention that if you hadn't assumed, I mean, it's, it's set in Agatha Christie's real uh, time frame. Uh, so, so the books take place in around 1902 when Agatha Christie would have been 12. Um, and so the first one was really, it's set in Torquay, which is where she grew up. And um, it's, it's very much just a, a village murder. And then the second one is a country house in a blizzard murder. <laughs> and then um, after the second one, the, the publisher wanted another one. We talked about a third, but they wanted four. And I was thinking, okay, but four is really going to be it, I think, because th they were pretty big to write. Yeah. Um, I was, they were my first mysteries. So I was really learning and it was uh, a lot of research for each one, of course, because of being um, historical, and just uh, it felt like a good a good size. Plus, how you know she's already found four bodies. How many bodies are you going? <laughs> <laughs> really, realistically, yeah. how can we keep going? So, so it just felt like a good size to have to have the four. And so, she well, was some series seem to find an infinite number of bodies. I mean. <laughs> I just, I mean, I was mainly interested in how did, how did this particular little girl grow up to be thinking about murder from the beginning of the day to the end and to write, you know, 300 at least murders in her character. So that was, that was, she definitely had to be thinking about it. That was my main, my main thing. Do you have plans for more mysteries or are you kind of uh, taking a vacation from mystery after this? I'm actually working on it just suddenly and and very close to the beginning, um, a contemporary mystery. So we'll see yes. what happens. That's good news. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful to hear that. Uh, Julie, so uh, you would kind of, you know, you, you've already explained sort of how you came to write your first middle grade book, which I think is an uh, experience that a certain number of authors who start writing for older audiences and then write, uh, you know, middle grade or picture books can have shared, you know, suddenly looking at the young readers in their own home and, and suddenly saying, wait, I could write a book for you. But tell us a little bit about how, how that experience has been different from, from the previous books you've written, or, you know, do you, did you share the book with your uh, son while you were writing it? Or, you know, do, do you use them as like a first kind of reader as you work? Yeah, I found, I found, so I've written for adults, YA and middle grade. And I think the adult and YA, the process has been very similar for me and middle grade felt very different um, in a way I didn't anticipate. I did not use my son so much, but I did use my daughter. So I have a 13 year old daughter 
who is a giant reader, like a true reader. And my son is more of a reluctant reader. Um, and having both of those in my house has been incredibly helpful because when I'm writing the Area 51 files, I'm very aware of my son's attention span and my daughter's attention to detail. And those sometimes are at odds. Um, and they both help me write. They Both of those sort of perspectives help me write the book. Um, but my daughter has edited um, all of my Area 51 files books um, and now edits my YA and has started her own editing business because she's actually that good at it. Wow. Um, and so she's been a huge, huge help. And she's really good at telling me um, what where kids would stumble, what they're more interested in, um, what words are too big. And if I'm going to use that word, then it should be a choice, not an accident. Um, she's also 13, so she's devastating in her comments, <laughs> so that, which is really helpful to <laughs> the perspective of an editor who really does not care about your feelings, yeah. uh, who just straight up is like in the, in the margin, she'll write like, not funny, mommy. And I'm like, <laughs> not funny. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so that has been extraordinarily helpful. But in terms of switching um, from YA to middle grade, the biggest thing for me is I think thinking about who the reader is, and in sort of a Pixar sort of way, you know how like a Pixar film, um, they're writing to adults and children at the same time. Um, when I was writing the Area 51 files, I was very conscious of the, you know, the eight to 12 year old who's sitting on their own reading this book and needs to be, um, have enough narrative engine for them to turn each page, right? Um, and go from chapter to chapter and be excited on every single page. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, that eight to 12 year old might be on a parent's lap. And I wanted to think about the parent experience as well. And so maybe 95% of the jokes in the Area 51 files is meant for the kid. There are 5% of jokes in which they'll go right over the kid's head. And it's for the parent who has this delicious kid on their lap. Um, and I, I had a lot of fun sort of playing in that space um, where the joke will not take the kid out of the story. I don't want to bump a kid with a joke, but I also want to, you know, you know, tip my hat at the other mom who has a kid on their lap, because I cannot tell you how many times I have read books with my kids on my lap. And it's a particularly exciting experience when there's just a little, you know, a little zinger for me. Yeah. Um, also, uh, I have very different, I'm at the same publishing house for my YA and my middle grade, but I have very different editors. Um, and so my editor on the YA side is a little bit more serious. She does not let me get away with fart jokes. Um, and the Area 51 files is stuffed full of like very silly jokes and fart jokes in particular, um, which for me is just like an absolute joy that I get paid to write fart jokes. It's very you liberating. Had, yes, if you had told eight-year-old me that this is be like how I make a living, she would not have believed you, but she would have definitely done a happy dance. So, um, yeah. Now, have you gone out and done school visits for Area 51 files? I have, and they're really fun. So now at this point, I've done school visits at every age group. Um, and the elementary school kids are my absolute favorite. Um, as I mentioned, I have a 13 year old who's in middle school and middle school kids are the worst. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I take that back. Middle school kids are amazing. And I, <laughs> and I love my daughter and I love her friends and I love spending time with them. I do not like getting up on a stage in front of them because they are terrifying. Um, they are still so self-conscious. And so they're, they think before they laugh. Um, but elementary school kids do not, they are just with you and they're excited to spend time with you and hear what you have to say. And they ask the most ridiculous, hilarious, fun questions. Um, so elementary school kids are my favorite in terms of school visits, but I would like to make sure I say that I love middle school kids. I just, you know. <laughs> we can say what we want. They're not watching. <laughs> No, but they are, they, they can be a tough crowd, uh, delightful intellects, tough audience sometimes. <laughs> um, as usual, I have uh, gotten so interested in the follow-up questions and going on that I, I, I have a half dozen uh, questions that I was hoping to kind of like throw out there and get everybody just to kind of weigh in on. And now we're five minutes from the end of the hour. Um, I, I want to close by asking each one of you, um, if you, if you would, 
uh, share sort of the best piece of advice you have for somebody who is contemplating writing for kids? Because I'm, you know, we may have people who watch this either now or uh, the recording on YouTube or something. Um, I'm always, I know I'm always hearing from people who write for adults who haven't written for kids and they're very curious about what it's like. So maybe if you could offer kind of the best piece of advice you have for somebody who's contemplating writing for younger readers, uh, coupled with maybe the worst piece of writing advice that you have. <laughs> received, whether in adult in, in response to adult writing or writing for kids or anything, but a piece of good advice for our listeners and a piece of bad advice that you you might have received at some point. Uh, uh, Julie, why don't we start off with you? Okay. Uh, my best piece of writing advice, I think, applies whether you're writing for kids or adults. Um, and I think it, it, the best thing you can do as a writer is to read and to read everything, but not read things as a reader, um, read things as a writer and have every book you read be a lesson. Um, if a book is particularly working for you, you, you figure out why it's working for you. If a book is not working for you, you think about that. How did the writer pull it off? Um, and that way, every book you read is a masterclass. I think specifically writing for children, um, I think you need to spend a lot of time with children um, and see what happens in their head and what they find funny and what they don't find funny, what bumps them, what doesn't. Um, my kids have been inordinately helpful um, on that front. Uh, and then I think the worst piece of writing advice I've ever gotten is to follow the rules. I think it's really important to know the rules of genre um, and to understand the expectations of genre. But once you understand the expectations, you can throw them away and only and break them, but break them consciously. Um, and so I think it's important not to just, you know, blindly follow rules. Excellent. Good, good, good advice and bad advice. Uh, Kekla, how about you? I think, you know, I definitely agree with everything that Julie said. I think, um, you know, the best advice that I would give is to recognize that, you know, nobody sits down and writes a novel, you know, you don't wake up one morning and are like, I'm going to write a novel, like the way that you might wake up and like, I'm going to read a novel today. Like you can read a book in a day. Some people can, I can't, but most, <laughs> a lot of people can, um, but you can't write a book in a day. You, you have to do it a little tiny bit at a time. And so I think that people, a lot of people don't sit down to write at all because they feel like they can't do enough or they don't know what happens in the whole story or they don't um, like think, believe in their voice or something like they, they just, they think it's not enough. I think writers often have that sort of like, we have self-consciousness on a number of different levels and concern about how it looks on the page and things. Um, so I think that you have to just show up and write um, and you can write just a little bit. Like even as a professional novelist, like I can write one page a day, double spaced. <laughs> um, and get a novel drafted in far less than a year, right? Uh, when I do school visits, I hold up the book and I say, okay, like I hand it to somebody and I'm like, okay, if I write, you know, a page a day for a year, how many pages do I have? And they shout 365. And then we're like, okay, how many pages are in this book? And somebody <laughs> goes to the back of the book and 289, oh, you know, <laughs> and I don't even bother to explain that like manuscript pages are actually even, you know, it ma makes it even more extreme. Um, so, you know, you can write half a page a day, double spaced and still like have a novel draft in a year and it's if you think about it that way um it's a lot less intimidating than the idea of sitting down and writing a novel um and i think you know just to pick up on what julie said uh, again like i think that the the worst advice is just anybody who tells you that they're you have to do it a certain way just you have to approach writing a certain way like for me that's like outlining people are like you must have an outline before you start writing and i'm like no you don't <laughs> you can do whatever you want i use outlining as a revision tool outlines are important but always having an outline before you start writing, you don't need that, you know? So anybody who tells you there's only one way, yeah, don't don't listen to that. I love I love the idea of, of reminding people they can write a little bit at a time. I think it was P.G. Woodhouse who said, I think he wrote something ridiculously small, you know, 300 words a day or something, but he just, he, he would tell people, well, I just add them up and every so often I have a book, you know, which is a great way to look at it. It's also true. I mean, you know, that's how it happens. Yeah. Martha, how about, how about you? What's what's the best advice you can give to somebody who wants to write for younger readers? And, and what's the maybe worst advice you have received? I think I will start with the worst. And sure. and because that they're they're related. Okay. And uh, I do agree with everything that everyone else has said. But this, this is even more specific. Um, I would when someone told tells me or has told me, you have to get your first page right. You need to start there so that you know where you're going and, and get, you know, get it together right from the beginning. And then you, you have a good road ahead of you. I think that's terrible advice. I generally 
leave the first page till the end. I mean, you know, roughly where your, where your story is going to begin, but some people spend so much time writing and rewriting and getting the first sentence in the first paragraph and writing it again. And it's a total waste of time because by the time you get to the end of the book, You've spent a lot of time with the characters. Your voice is much more clear. You you have the rhythm. You know what has to happen so that it's a circular thing. So I say ignore the beginning and get to the end and then start over. And that's that's the advice I would give. Wonderfully said. Sam, it looks like you're going to bring us home today. I can, well, I confess, I completely agree with everything that um, has just been said. Martha, I, that was my kryptonite, was always have, trying to go back to the beginning and fix the beginning so that I could get to the end and never getting to the end. It was like building a bridge that never reached the other side of the canyon. I've got so many half-completed things that um, I ruined myself editing to death. Um, but I... This is widely given out as a piece of writing advice, and I think I'm going to just say it's terrible. Um, I'm going to start with the worst as well. I think the worst piece of writing advice is write what you know, because I don't know anything. Like a lot of people, a lot of, I think that's, that's such a closed box mentality, I think. Uh, and the idea that we all have to stay in our lane and write the things that are our own experiences. And obviously it's nice to be rooted in yourself, but I, people always assume that I know loads and loads about trains and I'm some kind of expert in trains and expert in mysteries. And I feel like I do know an awful lot more than a lot of people, but like if you spend any time as I do on Twitter talking to railway engineers, it becomes very quick, <laughs> really apparent that I know nothing. <laughs> there are so many things that I don't know about the subject that I'm writing about. And, you know, uh, I love mystery stories, but I'm not the most widely read mystery aficionado in the world. My knowledge is very patchy, but what I do have is a sense of what I find interesting. And that I think is what, I think is the is the right direction of travel. So I think my piece of writing advice would be write what you want to learn about, because you feel like we all have a compass in our head that points towards the things that we find interesting, like a sniffer dog we can follow down. I can find the things about trains that I find fascinating. And I know 10 year old me would find fascinating. And I know 10 year olds today would find fascinating. And that is where I want to go. That is what I want to learn. I don't spend my time writing a book regurgitating stuff I already know inside out. I spend my time working out what I find fascinating and learning as much about it as possible, discovering amazing stuff that I want to turn into a story. Um, and I think that really, for me, is the secret to writing specifically stories for younger readers as well, because I find the world a fascinating and exciting place, and I think children do as well. And so doing my best to translate that sense of wonder into a story for a younger reader is normally something that aligns our interests because I mean, unlike Julie, I, you know, I, don't, I don't have kids. I don't spend a lot of my time around kids, but I'm quite a childish person in many ways. <laughs> and so uh, I feel like I, um, different people end up writing kids books for different reasons. And I feel like the inner child in me uh, is always who I'm trying to write for. And I, yeah, I follow my sense of what I find interesting. So yeah, write what you want to learn about would be my, my piece of advice. I could not agree more. And what wonderful words to, to send us out on. Uh, Martha, Kekla, Julie, Sam, I would like to thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I wish uh, Maya and Michael could have joined us, but I'm looking forward to seeing all in New York who can make it to New York uh, this coming week. Um, so those of you who are watching from home can join us tomorrow, Monday, April 24th at 6 p.m. Eastern for a conversation with the nominees for Best Young Adult. Uh, I believe the links are in the chat. And uh, you can learn more about the Edgar Awards by following us on social media using the hashtag Edgars2023 or by visiting the websites mysterywriters.org and edgarawards.com. Thank you all so much and congratulations.